Hi, my name's John Pemberton, and over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to try and answer this question. Does the type 1 diabetes community understand the risk of using all the CGM devices? And the answer is for some yes, and for others no, despite them all having CE marking and being available certainly within Europe and the UK. Now, I've got type 1 diabetes and had since 2008 and I help look after about 300 children with type 1 diabetes, so this is really important to me, and I think it's also important for everyone to understand no CGM is risk-free, but it's important we're able to understand the risk and make appropriate decisions when we're deciding what we want, and also how to use it. So let's take us go. So just as a little bit of a background, in March this year, or last year, the regulations of the UK were updated so that CGM should be made accessible for all people with type 1 diabetes and it is gaining accessibility worldwide. And there was a suggestion that accuracy should be the first decision making factor, but there was no guidance on how to decide accuracy. And when a device has CE marking, it can be perceived that it is a substitute for 100% clinical data evaluation, that it has definite data on the indications that it's been given for adults and children with type 1 diabetes. But as we'll see, that's not necessarily the case. So it's really the, un, important that we understand what we call the conformity assessment process behind CE marking. How does CE marking system work and give these indications for use for these devices? So I spent about the last year of my life trying to understand this, the regulation and also accuracy, and some help by some fantastic co-authors. We put together a paper and what I'm going to do is talk you through the key elements of that to help you understand, do we know the risk? So what we did is we contacted all of the CGM device manufacturers in the UK and asked them for what their CE marking was for type one diabetes, age groups, what accuracy data they had to back that up. And then essentially what we wanted to do is say, if these devices have CE marking for adults and paediatrics or adults and children, do they have data to back that up? And then using the American what we call FDA ICGM criteria, currently in the, the most robust accuracy standards, how do all the devices available stand up to some of those accuracy criteria? And then finally, thinking about if we are to change the regulation because we're not happy about no, or not currently not knowing the risk, what are the pros and cons of changing regulations? So what did we find? So this is important to understand, is that when a device or a manufacturer wants to get CE marking, they use the 1993 directive, which essentially they complete an application form called a Declaration of Conformity. And what they have to show in that is that they meet essential requirements for a medical device in class 2A or class 2B. And they can do that by providing just a small representative sample of the data that they um, potentially hold. And also they could, if they can justify to what we call a notified body, a person who checks this, um, a data from a device of equivalence, if they can justify that their device is similar to another device, then they can use their data to actually prove that it's um, got clinical data to be used. So once they've completed that, they employ a notified body who then works with them to go through it and see whether they actually meet the essential requirements through meetings and discussions. And interestingly, the manufacturer can actually switch. If they don't like the decision, they could switch to another notified body without necessarily declaring that. Once they've agreed that it meets the essential requirements, you then get a four digit approval CE mark. Um, but unfortunately, there's no approval document. There's no document that states the clinical data that this device submitted and how it meets you know, people with type 1 diabetes, adults and children. So people like me and people like you don't have access to what the clinical data is to decide whether we feel um, it's a low enough risk for us to use. So kind of you can see there's some potential that there may be not quite the clinical data behind some of the devices that are available. So when we take a look at this, we've got on um, all the products available in the UK market at the moment. You've got, they've all got CE marking, and then also we've got where they have American or Australian approval. And on the simplest level, does the publicly available data that was supplied actually match the age range of indications that they were given. So basically, if they're given from two years old, do they have data from two years old? And you can see from the American and Australian perspective, all the data matches up. However, there are four devices available that have indications age ranges wider than the clinical data provided. So looking at those in a bit more detail, you can see here 
These are the four devices. Now, interestingly, three of those devices use class 2A, which is the lower risk for when they put their application in, whereas every other single CGM device uses class 2B, a higher risk. Why that is and why that was allowed, I'm not quite sure. And also you can see that all these devices have clinical data available from 18 years and above, yet they have indications for use for much younger than that. So that means one of two things, that when the application was sent in, you can see that either they gave a representative sample of their clinical data, so therefore they gave the 18 year olds and said that that's representative of the, the younger children, but we know that younger children have different um, accuracy results usually than the adults or that they submitted a device of equivalence, someone else's, another device's data, and justified that it was suitable equivalence, which again, considering that the devices are quite different in how they uh, measure things and how they work, again, that's hard to know. And the key thing here is we don't actually know because we have no approval document to tell us whether it was a representative sample or whether it was someone else's data that they used. So I think that's a pretty unacceptable situation when we're the ones who are actually making the decisions for the people who we support, or if you've got type 1 diabetes, you want to know what the risk is for yourself. So now that we know that we actually have to have a look at each device's clinical data, how are we going to assess it? Well, the first thing we need to have a look at is when they did the accuracy data to see how accurate it was, what was the study design? Did they use only people with type 1 diabetes or did they use people a lot of people with type 2 diabetes as well? Did they use the correct method for comparing the continuous glucose monitoring result against, not a blood glucose monitor, but something like a yellow spring instrument from venous blood? And then finally, did the study design protocol, what the people had to do when they were undergoing the tests, does that match what the person does in, in their real life? So did they have hypos? Did they have highs, for example? So those are the three things to look at. So when we look at those, the first thing you will notice is for the adult data, that the percentage of people with type 1 diabetes varies considerably. So you can see at the top there, the Dexcom 1 and G6 and Freestyle Libra 2 studies were virtually all type 1 diabetes, and then it starts to drop down to 80%, then 70%, and effectively the ones at the bottom with you know, nearly 50% or less had half of the people in the study with type 2 diabetes. Now, why that is a problem is people with type 2 diabetes preserve a glucagon response, which means that their lows don't go quite as low, and also their highs don't go quite as high because they retain some insulin producing capability. So their ride of their glucose is a lot steadier, which means their accuracy results are a lot more accurate than a person with type 1 diabetes would experience. So you can't be sure, especially with the less than 50%, that their results are going to match anything that happens to a person with type 1 diabetes. So they're not particularly useful. And then also, you can see whether they had glucose and insulin challenges. So during the study protocol, did they give them extra insulin to make them go low? And did they give them um, food without insulin to make them go high to represent what would happen in a usual life of someone potentially with type 1 diabetes? And most and those ones at the bottom don't. So again, those three that I've highlighted, it's almost impossible to say the results from those studies would they replicate in real life for people with type 1 diabetes. So again, we're going to have no idea of understanding the risk. Now, obviously the Libra 3 didn't include glucose and insulin challenges. Now that might be okay for someone like me who did never gives too much insulin to go low and also always gives insulin for um, food so they never go too high. But again, that doesn't really count for people who occasionally miss um, food and then without giving insulin go high and also overcorrect insulin. So that's probably the vast majority of people. So those results won't really reflect what happens for, for that type of person. Now, from a children's perspective, you can see that pretty much all of them um, for the studies were using people with type 1 diabetes. But again, the Freestyle Libra 3 results, probably 80% of the children that I support have give too much insulin and go low and have food without insulin and go high. So it's hard to say that those results will actually reflect what the people who I support um, encounter in real life. So now once you understand study design, Really, we shouldn't even be looking at the results of these bottom three because they don't reflect anything that will happen with type 1 diabetes. And we need to be a little bit cautious of the Libra 3 results, especially for children, because again, um, they're probably not going to reflect what a lot of children and young people's lives are. So once we understand study design is the most important thing, and then we think about how do we look at deciding what is accurate and what isn't accurate, and what we kind of call as like point accuracy. At the same moment in time, 
What's the difference between the continuous glucose monitoring result and then the reference method, which in this point um, is going to be what we'll call venous yellow spring instrument, a very accurate measure. And at this point, you can see the difference is about 7%, 5.5 to 5.2. And if something had what we call a MARD, mean, ab mean absolute relative difference of 7%, it would make you think that, oh, all the results must be this accurate if on average it's 7% difference. But the reality is averages don't really tell us very much. So the best way to think about this, so most people say, oh, if a device has the accuracy of a MARD of 10% or less, then it must be very accurate because most of the results are within 10%. Well, what we really need to know with continuous glucose monitoring is not the average. And the best way to think about this is if you couldn't swim and you was going to cross a fast flowing river that was on average four feet deep, would you cross it? Hopefully the answer would be no, because you have no idea of how deep it is in certain parts and what the risk is for you. So if you tried to cross this, you would be in a lot of trouble. So we really need to understand what happens in the tails. And what I mean by the tails is in the far ends of the distribution. When you're very low, how accurate is in the very low range? And when you're very high, how accurate is in the very high range? Because you're either going to be making hypo treatment decisions in the low range or potentially giving insulin correction decisions in the high range. And if it's the accuracy is not very good in that, the risk is very high by overdoing insulin and also missing hypos or treating hypos that are not, that, not there. So looking at average results tells nothing. We need to look at the accuracy in the low and the high range. And probably the best way to do this is the ICGM point accuracy performance. So it's a lot of information, so let's break it down. So first of all, you want to know in the low range, less than 3.9 millimoles per litre. So for example, you want to know how often is the continuous glucose monitoring result within 0.8 millimoles per litre of the actual reference method. So it's accurate enough. So usually that kind of level or 15 milligrams per deciliter, if you use milligrams per deciliter, if the accuracy is within there, you're pretty much going to make a safe hypo treatment decision and not miss any significant lows. So this criteria requires at least 85%, almost 9 out of 10 readings to be within that level of accuracy. And certainly no more than 2% of the readings that are out by more than 2.2 millimoles per litre in that range. So if they meet both those criteria, it's accurate most of the time and has very low levels of significant inaccuracy that's going to cause you a problem. In the time in range where you're not actually making any decisions, you don't require as, as high an accuracy, so only 77 out of 10 of the readings to be within 15%, but you don't want any more than 1% of the readings to be more than 40% out. Again, in the high range, you want as many within 15% as possible, so 80% within the readings that will be very accurate, and you certainly don't want any more than 1% of the readings that are very inaccurate, where you would potentially give bigger correction doses than you would need. So when we break it down like this, it makes it easier to understand how many of the readings are very accurate and how many of the readings will potentially cause us a problem. We'll have a much better idea of the risk of using different continuous glucose monitors. And just to show you why you would use sort of 15, 15 or not 20%, for example, here you can see on the first picture, if the, gluc if the CGM was reading 3.2, then the, if the glucose reading this point will be 3.9, that would be within 0.8, you would actually pick up the low glucose level. Whereas actually if it was 3.2 on the CGM and it was actually 4.2 on the, on the glucose reading, you could see that would be accounted in 20% as accurate, whereas you'd actually make an incorrect decision. So using 15% rather than 20% is that's the reason why in terms of understanding very accurate readings. Similarly, in the high range, if you was here, the CGM was reading 13 and the glucose level was actually 11.1. If you was correcting down to 6, you wouldn't cause yourself a problem. So within 15%, you would make an accurate decision. With 20%, you could have a situation where the difference is here. If you did a correction at 13 when you was really 10.5, you would end up then being sort of 3.5, for example. So using the 15% rather than the 20% gives you the idea of how many, what percentage of those readings are actually very accurate that are going to cause a very, very low risk. So this is a lot of information. So this is the adult data, and this is it broken down by the accuracy with 15-15 in the low, in target, and high range. And what you can see is the ones in bold are the ones that actually meet the criteria of having a very high level of accuracy. And what I do want to point out is, obviously the Dexcom G7 and Dexcom G6 meet those criteria, and you would look at this and say from the adult data, 
that the Dexcom G7 is more accurate. But when you think back to the study design and they had almost 20% of people with type 2 diabetes in there, you have to ask the question, has the G7 improved accuracy on the G6 or is it just because more of the people in the study had type 2 diabetes and there was less variability? We could know the answer to that if Dexcom published the results of the type 1 diabetes only. Similarly, for the Shisal Libra 3, is it more accurate in the in the time in normal range by almost sort of five, six percent, or is it the fact that they used you know 15, 20 percent of people with type 2 diabetes and didn't actually use insulin and glucose challenges to make the glucose level go up and down, therefore providing more accuracy? What is worrying from a CE marking perspective is that the Guardian 3 doesn't have an indication to be used without finger pricks in the low and the high range to make treatment decisions, whereas the Glucomende does. Yet in the low range, almost one in two readings is going to be out of that, you know, 15, 15 accuracy. So the differences between um, indications granted um, for CE marking for whether you do or don't need to do finger pricks, the inconsistency there seems quite worrying. And obviously for the Guardian 3, Guardian 4, we don't actually have the data presented in this format to allow us to understand the risk. Now from the very high, from the very high level of inaccuracy, you can see in here the vast majority have a very um, low risk of readings being more than sort of forty percent out. But what I do want to pick out here is again um, is the glucamine day. Certainly in the low range, up to five percent of the readings are going to be more than two point two out in the low range. And again, when you're considering getting in a car for driving and it's going to be that far out five percent of the time, you might decide, although it has an indication to be used for without finger pricks, you might decide that you want to um, for that particular reason. But the good thing is we understand now that we have the data, we can understand this risk for some of the other devices, such as um, the Metrum Nano and the Gluco ADX. We don't have this information to look at because it's not actually on people with type 1 diabetes. It may be very low risk or it may be very high risk. The point is we just don't know. And again, we don't know from the Guardian Center 4 because it's not presented in that format. Now from the pediatrics, the first thing you will see for children and young people is that the accuracy decreases, generally because they're a lot more erratic in terms of their movements and the glucose level goes up and down. Therefore, the accuracy drops. But what you can be confident at is that the G7 is definitely more accurate than the G6 because this was all in children with type 1 diabetes only. So a significant improvement for the G7 um, over the G6. So that gives us good confidence there. And again, probably the Freestyle Libra 3 is the same accuracy as the Freestyle Libra 2 because it's the same sensor and same algorithm because actually when you compare just 100% of children versus 100% of children with the 2 and the 3, the accuracy is almost the same, which is a very good level of accuracy. It's just not necessarily improved. And again, with the Guardian products from the children's, we don't actually have this data broken down for us to see, for us to understand the risk in that particular cohort. For the very high readings, again, you can see here there has been an improvement significantly from the G7 in the hypoglycemia range. Um, and again, we don't really have the data from the other devices to actually see the, the readings that would be very out by 40% for quite a lot of the devices. So you might think at this point, we you know kind of that's seems fairly unacceptable. What could we do with the regulation to potentially change it so that we could understand the risk better? Well, the first thing is, is that the European um, Directive was updated in 2017 and it's only just come into a full effect in 2021. And that's suggesting there should be better study design criteria, better reporting and also greater oversight by bodies such as the MHRA to actually ask these companies um, for the data if they don't feel it's adequate. Only the Dexcom G7 has got approval under this um, new regulation so far, so it's difficult for us to know is what we said earlier, for example, the three products that had indications for children without data, would they still get through or not? Because they still allow a representative sample of clinical data and also data from a device of equivalence. Now in the UK, it's actually set to go one step further in actually requiring 100% of clinical data, suggesting to use existing practices of study design uh, and reporting criteria, actually have a da database where you can have the clinical data that backs up the indications, make the companies have a UK specific person who'd be liable for adverse events and potentially move um, automated insulin delivery systems into class three. So that looks like set for um, July 2024 to potentially uh, improve the regulation. But 
CGM devices with existing CE marking will be honored until their expiry, which is 2025. So the devices that we've discussed where we're not sure about the risk are still going to be be available for 20 till 2025. And that potentially is a, an issue that requires addressing. There are some downsides and some risks of changing the regulation. For example, we end up with the regulators deciding what's going to be useful rather than the community with type 1 diabetes. Could be slower access to technology. For example, the US does not have the 7HEG yet and we've seen how useful and brilliant that product is. The Freestyle Libre was able to evolve their products from the first, second to third generation by quick um, approvals and also gaining a lot of data and feedback on their um, device to be able to improve it very quickly. And also there is a risk if we tighten, and well, if we took that away, then obviously future products like Libra wouldn't be able to get that feedback and improve as quickly. And then also there is a bit of a triopoly of Dexcom, Medtronic and Abbott. By making the regulations very tight and stringent to me, is it going to make it impossible for young, uh, young and small startup companies to actually um, you know, make it through uh, to the point requiring so much money? So that could slow innovation by reducing competition. So that has to be considered. Obviously on the benefit side, if they did change it, then the clinical data should match the indications for use and there's more chance of the results that you see in the studies, actually you getting it in real life. At the moment for someone like me as a clinician to be able to help my, the people that I support decide, it means I have to evaluate every single device and the clinical data. Whereas if we had a regulation that actually did that beforehand, we could be confident in using it. And it's all going to be based around whether we think that the IFCC working group are developing some standards and what they were going to do is potentially develop a set of study design and regulations that are based on according to whether you're going to be using is it as a interoperably for several automated incident delivery systems whether you get it as a one that will be allowed to be used without finger pricks or with finger pricks so that is going to be an important thing to hopefully speed it up so what can be done now? Well, the first thing is if we feel like we want to understand the risk better, we have to ask the national patient safety regulators to ask the companies for their declaration of conformity to see what kind of data we've got so we can see it. So for example, the three, four companies, uh, devices that have pediatric approval, um, which we could do with finding out that data. Obviously from Ju June, July, 2024, we could look at trying to support implementing these design and performance metrics. Really important that researchers and reviewers who are doing these studies really separate the data with type 1 diabetes and type 2, paediatrics and adults, and that they use the criteria that's out there to try and make them um, comparable. For clinicians who are looking at people with type 1 diabetes to understand the risk, obviously we need to look at study design first. If the study design has too many people with type 2 diabetes and they're not reported separately, if they um, don't induce don't do insulin and glucose challenges and don't get in that range of movement, we need to consider that. And if they doesn't look like the results will match the people who we support, we shouldn't be looking at the performance until we can understand that clearly. And obviously if you're a person with type 1 diabetes, now you know the risk of the different devices, you can vote with your feet. If you get offered a device that you don't feel has the level of accuracy, you can fight your corner because you know the risk. And also if there's no data there at all, then obviously that doesn't Again, going with unknown risk isn't as safe as going with something that you know the risk. And there will potentially be a lobbying effort that will be required to actually implement this IFCC study design and performance metrics. And that is something that if you felt strongly about, you could support. So if you feel that you want to kind of put your weight behind some of this, if you feel like it's something needs to change, I encourage you to sign up to the We Deserve Better as a type 1 diabetes community, whether you're a person with that type 1 diabetes, you're a person who supports someone with type 1 diabetes, whether you're a clinician who helps make people with type 1 diabetes decide on which system that they want, join up and I will contact you and give you information as we go along. And also, you know, feel free to, to tag me in Twitter um, where we continue the conversation. So thank you for your time. Hopefully that's given you an idea of understanding the risk of the CGM devices, potentially the need for a change in regulation and how we as a type 1 diabetes community can really support that.